I want to say welcome to our online guests. Those watching online, we're glad you tuned in this morning. It's a privilege to see you. Hey, we got a special guest with us this morning. I'm telling you, I am so excited. So, Pastor Jim Ryan, I got to meet him on an MVP call, which is with pastors all across the nation. And uh, this is a ministry with uh, Terry Allen, who he cares for pastors, and it's just a ministry thing there. And so with P Pastor Jim, what I'm excited about is Pastor Jim came, and he, he, he coaches pastors across the world. And uh, he also is the founder and the pastor of Westover in uh, San Antonio. But you'll like this. He pastors over 5,000 people there. He just did a transition to his son-in-law and saw a 27% growth. And so I've asked Pastor Jim to come in. He met with our leads. He met with my board. He's met with me and my wife. And it has been an amazing weekend with this gentleman. And I'm excited to let you hear him today. But the best part about him is he's New Mexican. Yeah, uh, Pastor Jim, I didn't ask you. Are you a Cowboys fan? Oh, okay. Guys, get ready for God to move in this place. Can we give Pastor Jim Ryan a huge Christian life welcome in this place? Well, good morning, everyone. Isn't it a great day? Wow, I'm delighted to be in Santa Fe to be at Christian Life. This is the best thing happening in the city right now, right in this room. Yes, thank you for being here. Uh, great pastors, Pastor Brian, Sister Pastor Cindy, thank you very much. One, let's give it up for our pastor. Incredible leaders. They love God. And can I tell you something? They love you. They love you they love you and it's just great to connect with them and be with you today what a delight now a uh, uh, pastor mentioned i pastored planted and pastored a church in san antonio for 37 years and uh, since then i've been traveling i i just got back from africa in just a few days i'm going to malaysia for a month to teach i was in 14 countries last year taught in six bible schools so i'm out and about but to be able to come home to the land of green chili oh yeah that is the best i've called my wife every day to tell her what i've eaten that day yeah again i passed her one church for 37 years northwest san antonio and if, if we passed it so long everywhere we go we meet people in the church uh, or family or related to we can't go to the cleaners we can't go to the doctor to the dentist to uh, the grocery store uh, i get stopped everywhere oh pastor can you pray about this pastor i need to tell you good to see you at every restaurant every coffee shop we go to it's all the time well here recently i was about ready to go get go overseas and i needed to go around and run some errands so i went to a shopping area and i needed to pick something up over here but the parking lot was full so i pulled over and i parked over on this side and i'm walking across to go to the place i need to shop at and there's this lady over there and she's waving at me happens all the time so i just wave at her and i continue walking across the parking lot but i noticed something she continues to wave at me i thought well maybe she didn't see me so i stopped and i waved again so i continued my journey and as i continued i noticed out of the corner of my my eye she's still waving i thought oh my goodness she probably has a prayer request or something going on a surgery and i, I better go talk to her because i don't want her to get offended because i didn't take time for her so i walked over there to talk to her she wasn't waving at me she was washing the windows <laughs> i'm always in pastor mode okay I'm just always in a pastor mode all the time, uh, incurably. Yeah, well, again, it's a delight to be with you today. If you have your Bibles, I invite you to join me in the Gospel of Matthew, uh, chapter number 11. The Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 11. 
And I want to speak on the subject today, take it on. Take it on. What is God talking to you about taking on? Did, was there a dream, an ambition that you were going to take on prior to COVID? Finish your master's degree? Start a business? What is, is there a dream that you had and you, you sidelined it for a season and now it's distant? Did, did God talk to you about a couple, about getting into counseling and getting, getting past that hump, that issue in the marriage, and you just haven't taken time, and it's time for you to take that on? Is there, is there a dream, an ambition? Is there something God has spoken to you you need to do, a ministry to be involved in? And you've put it to the side. Well, I'm here to invite you to take it on sometimes we can take on the wrong thing yeah have you ever gone to work for the wrong business yeah probably all of us have it sometime we we got a job and it was the wrong bit wrong job wrong career you 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 moved to the wrong place started a career I, I'm going to study this and and halfway through your first year of college you change your major if you ever take on the wrong thing, we call it a, a mistake. Yeah. You took on the wrong thing. But there is something God has for us to take on. And I want to go to a passage of Scripture that's probably in the top three most popular verses of Scripture in the Gospel of Matthew. Now, the Gospel of Matthew was written to the Jews Matthew the Levi he is trying to convince the Jews of the Messiahship of Jesus so in the Gospel of Matthew there are there's these Jewish customs there's this Jewish protocol that is respected in the Gospel of Matthew Mark is written to the Gentiles but the Gospel of Matthew was written and targeted to the Jews and it has some unique Jewish character to it. Let's begin reading here. And I want to just make note of something here. Verse number 25 and following. I'll read through this quickly. And Jesus said, I praise you, Father, for the Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden things from the wise and the learned and revealed it to little children. Yes, Father, for this is what you were pleased to do. All things have been committed to be by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, to those to whom the Son chooses to reveal them. Now, I only read that for you to see something. Matthew refers to God as Father. That's very much in the Jewish protocol. You see, in Jewish, Jewish protocol, you would never use the name of God. Why? Because in the Hebrew text, when you were reading the name of God and you would come to the Hebrew word Yahweh, they would not pronounce it. Why? Because it was thought in Jewish, in Jewish culture, if you accidentally, inadvertently even mispronounced the name of God and stumbled over a syllable, it was taking the name of the Lord in vain. So when they would read the Hebrew text and they would come to the name Yahweh, they would say Adonai. And Adonai was the word that would remind them there's this holy name Yahweh that you should not pronounce. This is very much in Jewish protocol. Isn't it interesting? In the Gospel of Matthew, we have the Lord's Prayer. And how does it begin? Our, there it is. In the Gospel of Matthew, it's not called the kingdom of God. It's called the kingdom of heaven. This is Jewish protocol. Now, with that in mind, I want you to go with me now to our text, which is verse uh, number 28 and the, and the following verses. Jesus continues, and he says, Come unto me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke. There's my theme today take it upon you take my yoke upon you and learn of me for I am gentle and humble in the heart and you will find rest to your souls for my yoke is easy and my burden is light okay now 
I have always heard biblical teachers say and refer to the yoke. Take my yoke upon you. They would use the imagery of a yoke of oxen. And, and that is to say, that is to say, they would refer to the yoke mentioned here that that there was a yoke of oxen and we're like God's like an ox on that yoke and we get we yoke up with him and we follow him and if you pull against him you're resisting I want to respectfully disagree with that why because Matthew writing to the Jews would never use an oxen, an image, or an animal to depict or communicate an image of God. It smacks of the golden calf. And writing in Jewish protocol to those to convince them of the Messiahship of Jesus, he would not use a yoke of oxen in order to communicate that image. This is the image right here. The yoke would be a single limb from a tree. And on either side there would be a rope dangling. And they would tie materials, uh, stone, grain, food, maybe even water. And they would carry it on their shoulders. This is the yoke. Not a yoke of oxen. It's a yoke that's on the shoulders. And they would take that. And Jesus said, come unto me and take my yoke upon you and you say that's hard that's difficult no if you will take God's yoke it's easy the burden is light now I have also heard these verses taught and quoted that the emphasis is come unto him I, I, I want to tell you the emphasis of these verses is not to come it's the take you come so you can take now I'm glad you came to church church online I'm glad you're online I'm glad you're here in the house of God but you can come in the house of God with the cares the burdens the difficulties struggle the sin the confusion the disruption in your life and leave the same way because the transformation is not coming the transformation is when you take upon you the nature of God when you take upon you God's nature when you take upon you God's pattern when you follow God's pattern when you do life God's way life gets better now let me see how I can illustrate this let me let me see if I can illustrate this um, for example right over here Mikey Mikey he's a part of the worship team Great, did a great job guys by the way today uh, let just just hypothetic just hypothetically let's just say hypothetically I come to church and uh, Mikey comes to me and says, Pastor Jim, I know you're here today, and uh, I'm a single guy, and I have found a lady in the church that I want to take out on a date. I, I, I want to take her. In fact, after church today, I, I'm going to, I, I've already got my plan. I'm going to approach her, and I'm going to ask her to go to, to go to Starbucks together. And I want to get her an enchilada macchiato, and I'm going to get me something as well. And we're going to share a single cake pop. That way we can nibble on it together, okay? Oh, this, I, 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 I really, I really like to make a, a connection with this girl. I really like to be, but Pastor Jim, I don't have enough money. And he says, Pastor Jim, I don't have enough money. Can I borrow some money? Absolutely. I want to help you. I want to help you. Are you are you single? I am, but we're going for the large. Okay, we're going for the church online. Take a look at it. He, he's a, he's a, he's available. Okay. Well, I, I I want I want to help my I want to help Mikey. Okay. Well, how do, what do you need? What 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 do you need? I need I need ten dollars, Pastor Jim. I'm going to help you. Now let me ask you a question. Is he closer to the ten dollars now than he was sitting down there? Is he is he closer to it now than he was just a moment ago? Can he buy her an enchilada macchiato yet? Not until he takes it. God bless you, buddy. Have a seat.
Here it is. God's benefits, God's benefits will never show in our life until we take upon us what he said to take upon us. Until we do life God's way, <laughs> until we follow the path that God has for us in our life. And here's what I've discovered in my personal life and in ministry. Halfway is heavier. Halfway is heavier. You go in halfway with God, it's heavier. But the hardest thing to do is halfway obey God. The hardest thing to do is go halfway. Well, you know what? I'm going to kind of do some religious stuff, and I'm going to pray about the, the things that I'm struggling with. But God, you, 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 don't, you stay out of my business when it comes to my career choice, and, and I'm going to make the choice regarding my spouse, and I'm going to make the choice regarding my finances, and I'm going to make the choice regarding everything else. But God, if I mess it up, I want you to come in and fix it. I will tell you, halfway is always heavier. The Bible says it's not until you take the yoke upon you does the burden get light. Going halfway in with God is heavier. Do you know it's harder to halfway tithe than it is to tithe all the way? Absolutely. The Bible says bring the whole tithe into the storehouse. Why? Because if you halfway tithe, you get no blessing. There's no blessing in halfway tithing. It's when you completely obey God, then God says, I will open windows of heaven for you. I will do something in your life. To halfway obey, you say, God, here's what I'm going to do. I want, you to, I want you to bless Sunday, and I want you to bless my business, but Friday nights and clubbing belong to me. That's my party time. God says, no, 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 no. It's a, if, you, if you tell me hands off in an area of the life, it won't work. Life always works better when God is control of everything. Um, here recently, I was going to take a flight and go overseas, and I'm in an airport, and I wanted a bottle of water. So I went up to the vending machine, and sure enough, there's the Fanta, and there's the Pepsi, and there's the bottle of water, and I wanted a bottle of water. It was $2. So I go up to the vending machine, and I put in a dollar. Do you know what, Pastor? I put in a dollar, and they didn't give me a half a bottle of water. Surely, if I put in a dollar, I ought to get half my water, right? No, I have to put in the entire amount, then I push the button. It's not until I do it all do I get any benefit from it. Same thing with God. It's not until you take up on you and do life fully God's way will you get the benefit. God has a way, and He's saying to all of us, there's something in your life you need to take it on. And I want to share with you today what I call take it on challenges. Take it on challenges. And I, hopefully this will connect with many of us, and perhaps God will just confirm something in our spirit. The first take it on challenge that I want to share with you is we need to believe positively. Believe positively. Now, we call ourselves believers but I'm saying believe positively. Some of us believe, but we don't believe positively. Oh, pastor, you know what? I really believe that God needs to heal me. He did something, but you know what? I'm already making plans. If it doesn't work out, we're, we found another place to move into, and if it doesn't work out, I'm going to get another. What, what a minute. What do you mean? You have a plan B already. You have, a, you, you have an exit door. You have an escape hatch already created there. I want to invite you, whatever God put in your heart, whatever dream the Lord spoke to you, I'm going to invite you to take it on. Believe positively. I've discovered, Pastor, if I ever borrow money, I want to borrow it from a pessimist. They don't ever expect you to pay it back. Amen? Uh, yeah. yeah. We need to believe positively. We need to believe. And here it is. Here it is. God is calling us to take a stand and believe positively. I believe if somehow, supernaturally, Jesus was to come back to earth and make a visit, and he was to do a TED Talk, a TED Talk, a five-minute TED Talk, and he was going to talk to every Christian and every believer in America and the world, and he had five minutes to do a, a, a TED Talk that to just activate the Scriptures in our heart, I believe he might give a five-minute TED Talk on the danger of neutrality. Mm. We have reluctance. 
we have hesitation, but it always takes you to neutrality. Well, I'm not really sure I can. I'm not really sure I can. I'm kind of thinking about it. I'm kind of considering it. As long as you're in the kind of era, you'll find yourself in neutrality. It doesn't really matter. We think, we think the Bible is a menu. Yes. Oh, I, I want a little bit of John. Let me see. No, I'm, I'm not into that Isaiah and Jeremiah stuff. That doesn't fit my diet today. It doesn't, it doesn't set well with me. It kind of disturbs me and gives me spiritual indigestion. Let me go to the dessert section. This, uh, it's, uh, it's all the blessings and the nice things. Here's what I'm saying. Everything in God's Word is for our benefit. Believe positively that God can and will do something in your life. Stand upon the promises. God doesn't get our spare time, and God doesn't get our spare change. He deserves the best. Go all in. Believe positively. Believe that God can help you launch that business. Believe that God can help you get your master's degree. Believe that God can do it. Believe that God can help you pay off that debt. Believe that God can restore that marriage. Believe that God can save that grandson. Believe for the best. In San Antonio, I have my favorite hamburger place. Oh, I, it's not McDonald's. It's, it, it's, it, it's not Jack in the Box. If that's yours, that's fine. I don't like to go to those squat and gobbles, but I have my favorite place to go to. Okay, there's this place I like to go to. It's D D Diana's Burger. The outside of the building is painted. The whole thing is Pepto-Bismol pink. Okay, the whole, the doorknob, the hinges, the we I mean, it's Pepto-Bismol pink. It's in an old area of San Antonio, but it has the best hamburgers. Can I tell you, when I want a hamburger, I'll drive to go to Diana's Burger there. It's on Guadalupe Street. It's in an old area of the city. And when you go down Guadalupe Street, you pull up and there's a stoplight. As soon as it turns green, you go up a block and there's a light and you wait and it changes and you go up another block. And you know I'm talking in an old section of the city. I'm driving down there one day. I come to one light, wait, turn green. I go up one more block, wait till it turns green. I go up one more block, and when I stopped at this stoplight, a woman got into the car in the front seat next to me. She doesn't have any shoes on. Her, her hair is matted. Her feet are, are muddy. Her clothes are are just a mess she leans over to me and she said I just got out of the mental hospital I just broke out of the mental hospital what would you do right now I'm thinking dear God I mean five ideas are bouncing in my mind in just five seconds do I turn off the key and get out and lock the door do I call the police do I go around and drag her out and then she's gonna have me arrested I what do I do I'm thinking what what do I do and finally in about five seconds I said I'll give you twenty dollars if you'll get out of my car right now she said okay I gave her twenty dollars and she got out of the car what's the moral Keep the doors locked. Amen. Ha ha! There it is. Keep the doors locked. Here's what I'm going to tell you. God gives you a promise. Keep the doors locked. Because at every corner, doubt, fear, insecurity, problems, naysayers will try to get in the car with you and talk you out of God's promise. You've got to believe positively for what God's going to do in your life. I'm pastoring a church in San Antonio. Pastoring a church in San Antonio. And I'm doing, I'm doing volunteer work at the county hospital. We do volunteer work. We serve as a chaplain. I go to the emergency room. This particular night, it was a Friday night. I was volunteering from 7 o'clock at night to 7 o'clock in the morning. If there are any emergencies that come in in the trauma unit, there's a chaplain there. We can talk to the patient. 
we go back into the trauma room we talk and pray with the patient and then if there's family we go out into the family room or out in the waiting room and we give reports to the family we go back and forth we're the liaison we're there for the spiritual care this particular night I'm working I'm doing volunteer chaplaincy and there happened to be a random drive-by shooting there was a grandmother that had an 11 year old granddaughter on her front porch and there was a random drive-by shooting and it struck that 11 year old in the middle of the forehead there was an exit wound in the back of her head the call came in the trauma unit team we're scurrying together. The moment the EMS arrived, the doors broke forth. They're racing. Doctors began to just gather around her, flashlight in her eyes to see if there's any movement in her pupil, screaming out uh, directions to the attendants, and they're moving. They rush her in. As the chaplain, I went out, and I ushered the grandmother into the family room. If they take you to the family room, it means that it's an impending dis issue and they want to give you privacy because you're probably going to get the worst news. I was going back and forth and as the, as the evening moved on and just minute after minute there were more family members that came and more family members that came. I still remember pastor when the mother came in she had heard about it and she comes in and she's just she's in shock. What is going on? The doctor walks in and I step in behind him in the family room. He has the white lab coat on. He has the stethoscope around his neck and he says ma'am your daughter has been shot in the head in a drive-by shooting we do not know if there's any brain activity we see an entry wound we see an exit wound we do not know the outcome we're running tests right now and we'll let you know they didn't know if she would ever walk talk even live through the night the moment the mother heard that I still remember the well in her heart and she fell back and fainted in there in the chair right there and family rushed to her her whole life was at stake I don't know if she's Catholic Protestant Assembly of God or nothing there's a moment it doesn't matter the label there's a time you call on God and say God we need you to intervene I prayed with him I said we'll just have to give this one to God and we need the miracle working power of God to intervene and rescue that little baby I'm back in for trying to give the family uh, updates on it I was back in the trauma unit when the doctor brought an x-ray out and the white screen that was there and he put the x-ray and it showed a profile of that little girl's skull there doctors were huddling around it and the doctor said I don't understand this and he pointed right at the forehead we have an entry wound he pointed to the back of the skull we have an exit wound he said to the doctors, I can't explain it. The other team, doctors began to come from other places in the trauma unit and looking at it, and they had a studied look. And here's what the doctor said. We have an entry wound. We have an exit wound. But there is no hole in that skull. That bullet never went through her head. She has no brain damage. Her skull is intact. Her, her skull is intact. She's not damaged. I don't understand it. We have an entry wound. We have an exit wound. But that little girl is completely good and in good health. And the doctor walked in and he said to the family, we are releasing her for you to take her home tonight. Here's what he said. We have an entry wound. We have an exit wound. And the only thing I can explain to you, the bullet hit her. It must have traveled between the skull and the skin underneath and exited here that's my only explanation but she is well and I'm thinking doctor you call it whatever you want but there is a miracle working God that rescued that little girl here's what I'm saying believe positively for what God has for you don't give up on the dream that God is speaking in your heart amen number two take it on challenge I want to invite you to care consistently. Care consistently. Do we care about the things that God cares about? Do we care about the things that God cares about? 
there's things that God cares about, but sometimes they're not our agenda. When I read the scripture, there's things that God cared about for the church of Corinth and the city of Corinth, but that was not the agenda the Corinthians had. I've been to the city of Corinth, and that city... It was about commerce. It was about this. It was about that. It was about lifestyle. It, 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 it was about, about being, a, a, if you please, a, a, a mecca of commerce of that day. But that's not God's agenda. God had a different agenda for the, the city of Corinth. You see, in your life, you need to care about what God cares about. Care consistently. I've discovered when you don't care for the things God cares for, you no longer hear the voice of God. We become tone deaf to the voice of God. When we don't care for the things that God cares, and our prayers, we don't pray, your kingdom come. We pray, God, let my will be done. Let my preference, let my agenda, let my schedule. Do God, you attend to me, and we're not saying, your kingdom come, your will be done. When we don't care about the things of God, then we don't hear God. And consequently, some of the blessings, some of the, some of the provisions, some of the goodness that we think, well, why, why are they blessed and I'm not blessed? Why do they get promoted and my son-in-law didn't get promoted? Why are they getting ahead and we're getting behind? Could it be we don't care? about the things God cares about. He said, take my yoke, care about the things that I care about. Pastor, I'm at the house. I'm in the other room watching TV, watching a, a game. I'm watching this game. And my wife, Denise, she comes in to talk to me. I'm engrossed in the game. And she says, Jim, I need you to. And I go, shh. Yeah. Yeah. the look on my wife's face don't tell me shh and at that moment that was not a good time to say would you get me a cup of coffee could you make me some nachos <laughs> would you crush up some some uh, avocados and make me some guacamole that was not the time to make a request why and she, she accused me of being thoughtless and careless. She did. Really, she did, Pastor. Me. Me. And I had to explain to her. She said, don't, shh, don't tell me, shh. That's rude. That's, that's thoughtless of you. Oh, oh honey. Honey, and, and, and wives and husbands, I'm going to help you today. I said, you misunderstood. You, you, you have misunderstood. When a man says, shh, it's some, for some people that may be mean, don't bother me. For some people that could even be a, a rude implication of shut up, don't talk to me. But that's not, that's not what, that's not what I meant. When, when men say, shh, it's the shortened form of sweetheart. <laughs> am, am I helping you, man? Am I helping you, man? Do I got an amen out there? Uh, okay. That's okay. It's, it's, it's what we mean. That's what we mean. It's the shortened form of sweetheart. <laughs> Denise, the reason I'm involved in this game is I'm learning lessons on how to be a better husband. And I want to get every lesson that I can out of this. And as soon as this game's over, I'm excited to go tell you what I've learned on how I can be a better husband and what I need and hear you out. She did not buy into that, can I tell you? <laughs> I tried, guys. I tried. Amen. I tried. When we care about the things that God cares about, it increases our spiritual bandwidth. It increases our spiritual bandwidth. Care about the things that God cares about. Number three, take it on challenge. 
encourage enthusiastically encourage enthusiastically encourage people people are beat up people are are weighted down and I found that encouragement is oxygen for the soul mm. yeah. it brings life to us encourage give them life the power of encouragement about a year ago before I stepped out as pastor I'm in one of our services. We do five services on the weekend. At the end of one of our services, a lady came down. She was right in the front. And she caught my eyes, and I could tell she motioned me over there. She wanted to talk to me, so I went to the stairs. We have stairs just like this on the side, Pastor. I walked down, and I met her in the middle. And there were children by her, and there was a man. And she said this to me, You probably don't remember me, but I attended your church over 20 years ago. She began to tell who she was. And Pastor, I remembered her. I remembered her. I remember when the family came to my church. She was an unprecocious 14-year-old. Little, innocent little girl, sweet as could be. But she made one choice, one bad choice. She got pregnant. They came to the church. They said, we just can't go back to our church. It's the, the scrutiny my daughter is under and the judgment she's under. We can't go there, but we need to tell you what's her condition. I remember when she, they were in my office, the little girl hung her head, her hair hung down, as it were, to hide her face. And I said, you're welcome. A few weeks went by. I have daughters, two daughters and I'm taking my daughters out for ice cream after school so I call the mom on the phone, this mother, this 14 year old I said I'm taking my daughters for ice cream could I come by and pick up your daughter and take her with us to ice cream the mother said you do that for my daughter I said sure, let's go have ice let me take them for ice cream she said be wonderful I swung by, I picked up that girl, had my two daughters with me. We went to ice cream. I had a suit on. I still remember this. We had that stacked it up with caramel chocolate with cream. I mean, it just stacked up. You know what I'm talking about? We go all out. I mean, I, I believe in double portions. Amen. And I, I still remember, I still remember this. And she told me that she, I had a suit on and I just lectured all the girls. Now, don't spill that. And as I did, I turned my elbow and I spilled my ice cream right in my lap. Yeah, on my suit. And they all laughed, you know, that you did. And I took her for ice cream. Let me go back to this moment about a little over a year ago. She said, when I felt like nothing, she said, you took me for ice cream. And she said, you turned my life around. And she said, now I'm married to a godly Christian man. We're in church serving God. My kids serve God, and we were coming back to San Antonio, and I wanted my family to meet the man that would take me to ice cream. You encouraged me when I needed it the most. Encourage enthusiastically. Number four, number four, give generously. Give generously. I'm going to invite the worship team to come forward if they would to join us on the platform give generously do you know there's something in every one of us that wants more that wants better every parent and grandparent you want your kids on the honor roll if you're a business person whatever the profits were last year you hope to make more next year no matter what size house you were raised in, you'd like to own a bigger one for your kids and you hope your kids have more than you. There is something in every one of us that God has put in our DNA to want better. So it is with the kingdom. 
so it is with the kingdom. I, I believe one of the take it on challenges is for God's people is to give generously. It is the one thing the world, the world cannot understand as believers. Yes, we truly demonstrate the nature of Jesus. We genuinely demonstrate the worth of the kingdom of God is when we give generously. Now I've discovered in pastoring there are five levels of givers. Five. There are non-givers. What do you mean? Five levels. There's a yeah, the non-giver. That's a level of giving. Somebody's coming new into the faith. And then they step into occasional giver. Yeah, I got a little extra this week and I came to church, so that's an occasional giver. Then there's a regular giver. They graduate from occasionally to say, I'm going to be a regular giver. I'm going to give, and they, they, they choose them out. Usually it's not their tithe, but they say, we're going to just start giving as we believe in the mission of our church and what it's doing and what Christian life is doing. We begin to give. Number four, there's tithing. is when we honor the Lord with the tithe. I tell every couple that I counsel for marriage and all the things you talk about in premarital, how many kids you're going to have, careers, whose career will be the dominant one. If somebody gets a transfer, would you follow that? Education, size of house, family, how we do it, where we're going to spend Christmas, and who's, we're going to go to Thanksgiving, and all those things you talk about. Talk about tithing. I can remember when my wife and I married, we talked about tithing. Because we were going to honor the Lord with tithing from the first day we got married. And I would have never married anyone that couldn't buy into the fact we're going to honor God. You see, tithing is not a financial question. It's a heart question is really what it is. And then there's the generous giver, the generous giver, generosity. And I want to invite us that take it on challenge, give generously. And I've come to this conclusion, and this is something that, that I do. This is something that my wife and I have practiced for years. If God saves it, God gets it. You say, what do you mean by that? We live by that. We tithe, but if God saves it, God gets it. What do I mean? I'll tell you, for example, the other day, I needed to buy new tires for the car. I needed to buy new tires. I've been driving here and I drove up here to New Mexico and, and I had over 50,000 on my tires and one tire was, it just, I knew we needed a new set of tires. So I went down to discount tire. I walked in, I'm going to buy four tires. I budgeted for four tires. I'm planning for four tires. And here's what the guy says to me at the counter. We have a sale. Buy three and get one free. Really? Buy three and get one free? God, you save it, you get it. God, you just saved $150. I was going to spend it anyway. I'd rather give it to the kingdom than discount tire. If you own discount tire, no offense, okay? No offense, okay? But that's what I did. God, you saved it. You get it. I walk in. I walk in, and if there's a 20% discount on the shoes, God, you saved it. You get 20%. We tithe, but God, you save it. You get it. That's what we We have lived of that. We practice generosity. And I'm going to invite you, a take it on challenge, is be a generous giver. Be a generous giver to the kingdom of God. Just a few years prior to COVID, we needed to build a new student center. I knew we did. Our old building was the first building I'd ever built. It was worn out, beat up and we needed a new student center. The size of the building was not really fitting for student ministry, middle school and high school. And I knew we needed to build a new student center. And I knew I was gonna make a transition just a few years down the road. And the Lord laid on my heart, the Lord laid on my heart, pay cash for it, don't borrow money. So I went to the board, we talked about it. I said, we're gonna build a new student center the board said, Pastor, we've needed one for years. Absolutely. And I said to the board, the Lord laid on my heart, we're to not borrow money. We're going to pay for it. We start construction. 
no sooner do we start construction, we go into COVID. Oh, the worst time. I mean, so all during COVID, I'm building this. We're not even having church. I'm building I'm building a brand new state-of-the-art student center, 13,000 square feet for middle school and high school ministry. So we, we started that, but we started the fundraising right before, before COVID. And as every building program we've ever had, I've given to it. I tithe, I give to missions, and we always give to the building program. And as pastor, I've always led the giving in our church and everything. I'll be the first one I jump in. I'm not going to preach it if I don't practice it. Amen. I'm going to go forward with it. And the Lord laid on my heart an amount we were to give. It was the largest amount that my wife and I had ever taken on to give to a building program. Follow, I'm talking about giving generously. It's the largest amount that we had ever taken on. And I felt like the Lord whispered into my heart we're to give it all in a lump sum to begin with and I knew we didn't have the money so I go to my wife I said Denise let me tell you what God's laying on my heart we're going to build a new student center and this is the amount and as my wife always says if God says do it we're going to do it she said what will we pay it out will we pay it over out over three years a thousand two thousand dollars a month above our time we're just going how are we going to do this you you tell us how says sweetheart I feel like the Lord said give it in one lump sum to begin with and her follow-up is we don't have that kind of money I said you're right well how are we gonna do it and you know you kind of rationalize you're taking I, I do the same thing you know well maybe maybe I didn't quite hear that God why would you tell me to do something I don't you know you know how you're rational no take it upon you that's what God said take that upon you I took that challenge upon me here's what we did I said sweetheart because we were getting ready to make a transition from pastoring we had just paid off our house two years earlier I said sweetheart if we go down and refinance the house and borrow against it we mortgage the house we can get the money and we can get it she said then do it we went down we borrow money against the house now, I'm not telling you to do this I'm, I'm not even implying you to do it. I'm just talking about what God put in my heart give generously we borrowed the money the first offering I gave it to the building program and we just decided we're going to start making payments all over again just God you're going to see us through it you're waiting for the rest of the story aren't you yeah yeah now <laughs> yeah Oh, I know what Pastor Jim's going to say. He got a check in the mail the next month and paid it off. Did it happen? No. Never happened. We have been making payments on it every month since then. Let me tell you what I didn't see, Pastor. We did that prior to COVID. He's 14 years old now. My grandson, when we finished it, he was now in youth ministry. He walked down the aisle of that student center that we gave to. My grandson knelt down and he surrendered his life to a call to full-time ministry. He said, he said, Papa, God has been talking to me and I've been wrestling with it and I believe I'm to spend the rest of my life in ministry and he did it in the student center that we sacrifice we make the we make the payment but can I tell you God's good God's paid us back the dividends of giving and I shared in that can I tell you that's a reward enough for me he's asked me a time or two Papa can you help me prepare sermons he's already preaching and I sit down and I help him prepare sermons. I've taken him on a mission trip to Africa already. And I told him, and God's going to put the world in your heart. Can I tell you, God's good. God's good. Whatever God is saying, whatever God is prompting, take it on. Because the yoke is easy. And the burden is light, Pastor.
Thank you, Brother Jim. What a word. Wow. What a word.